Hello and welcome to Wednesday's ITV News Meridian. Tonight's headlines here in the South East. Prince Charles and the Duchess of Cornwall in Kent hear how volunteers and social groups have come together to create a community in Ireland can have pride in. And a visit to Battersea Dogs Home on the North Downs, but not everything went quite according to plan. She went straight for the film crew. She's, you know, a bit of a one, this one. More travel for rail passengers from Sussex, longer journeys and cancellations as major upgrades to the network get underway. Good evening. It's been a royal visit unlike any other. Choirs and kittens, dogs and dockyards. And it started with a visit to a social centre on the Isle of Sheppey, where Prince Charles and the Duchess of Cornwall saw the work done to support migrants proud to call Kent their home. Are just days from the Queen's landmark Platinum Jubilee, the Prince of Wales told volunteers there that their work was invaluable in bringing the island community together. But as Sarah Saunders now reports, not everything on the itinerary went completely to plan. The Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall received an uplifting welcome at the Sheerness Healthy Living Centre today from the assembled dignitaries, crowd and Gillingham Community Choir. You may be different from me, I know I need you. It's been a surreal experience to be, to get a handshake from the number one citizen. I'm like, oh my God. So yeah, it's, it's a beautiful sensation and I'm sure my group will agree. Yeah! <laughs> Sheppy Matters hosts a wealth of volunteer and social groups, all dedicated to the well-being of this local community. Prince Charles chatted with members of 123 ADHD and Me, and Camilla met members of the I'll Support You project, challenging loneliness and isolation, and confessed she's not much of a knitter. They thought it was nice that we all help each other, we all teach each other, um, we make things for charity. Settled Syrian refugee Osama Khalid Sharkia, now studying computer science, has also become an ambassador with the Kent Refugee Action Network. It was just an amazing, brilliant meeting. We never expected that to be happening, but if that means anything, that means we are doing a great job at the ground. We are kind of being the voice for refugees and asylum seekers, and that's what is we meant to be. The recognition of the community work here has meant a great deal to volunteers and visitors. Oh, it was wonderful. At 83 and there I was, meeting royalty for the first time. Oh, it was out of this world. Oh, you can't imagine how I felt. We actually found out some of the songs you liked in advance. During the pandemic, the community radio station based here was a lifeline for many. Oh, and they liked to promote exercise too. Have you bought your swimming costumes? <laughs> <laughs> Their Royal Highnesses carried out a grand tour of Kent today, taking in seven different community groups, charities and businesses. And at the Battersea Cats and Dogs Home in Brands Hatch, a doggy guard of honour greeted the Duchess. Camilla's own Battersea rescue dog, Beth, joined charity ambassador Paul O'Grady's pet pooch, Sausage, in a training challenge. The aim? Not to become distracted. <laughs> <laughs> but more chance of me fucking things up. The Temptation Alley was fantastic. We didn't know how it was going to go, but uh, Beth was a, a convincing winner, I think it's fair to say, Try over Sausage. It looked as though nine-week-old kittens Jingle and Bell almost found themselves a royal residence to move into. Sarah Saunders, ITV News. Well, we saw Paul O'Grady in Sarah's report there, and after the Duchess left, we caught up with him. Paul, it's been quite a day for you and for the Bassey Dogs Home, but so important to highlight what they do now more than ever before. Yeah, you know, and also with uh, people going back to work again, you know, that they're not working from home. So there's a lot of dogs um, probably are going to end up in Bassey, you know, because they can't be looked after anymore. That's what I'm assuming anyway. They're facing so much pressure, aren't they, at the moment? So many dogs. They are not only dogs, cats as well. You know, I've just been, 
I've just been with two kittens and the temptation is unbearable. I mean, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of temptation, tell us all about Temptation Alley and why your dog Sausage, oh. who we can see there, let the side down today. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> this dog here, she's Romanian. She's a Romanian sausage dog. She doesn't speak much English except bedtime and biscuits. She understands that. <laughs> But uh, she failed miserably on Temptation. She went straight for the film crew. She's, uh, you know, a bit of a one, this one. Yeah, the, the, but the Duchess's dog did very well. That, she won. I'm afraid <laughs> me and Sausage lost miserably. Now mind. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a guard of honour for Camilla, wasn't there? What did you both talk about there today? Was... And what did she make of the whole day? Oh, she loves dogs. She, you know, she's the patron of Bassasine. She absolutely loves dogs. And we had a, a really sweet uh, West Highland Terrier called George who's in. He was 11 and he won't eat. So the pair of us sat in the shed together and um, gave him his worm pill and, um, and his flea treatment's on the back of his neck and he wolfed a load of chicken. So we just had a good chat. She's so easy to get on with, you know. She's such a lovely lady. She really is. I'm very fond of her. Now, you yeah, said earlier yeah, that Bassey yeah. looks after cats as well as dogs, and one of them took a real shine to you today, didn't he? Oh, God, this is always happens to me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I come in here, I'll like, brace myself before I come in here, I really do. It's like somebody who's a chocoholic and putting them in Cadbury's factory and saying, don't touch anything. It's, it's really, I've got five dogs now, all of them Bassasi rescues. And I have to say, rescue dogs are the best. So if you're going to buy a dog, anybody out there, if you're going to get a dog, sorry, don't buy one, rescue one. And because they're, they're always really grateful. I mean, look at this little one. She doesn't do a thing, I tell her. <laughs> she's so she's well at an armchair. <laughs> oh, she is. She's behaving. She knows she's on camera. She's an old pro. This one, I'm sure she. I'm sure she was a big star in Romania or something. <laughs> Were you? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> and we love her. So it's not just dogs that love you, then, Paul. Kittens also are a big fan of you. You're not tempted to take another dog home today or another kitten. No, I've been really good. Yeah, I've shown some self-restraint, so I think I've been really good. Yeah, I've got three pregnant alpacas at the moment, so I've got my hands full. <laughs> you certainly have. So, Paul, what are you hoping today's royal visit is going to achieve? I think it'll just highlight the work that Bassasi do, actually, especially at a time like this, you know, where we're probably going to get in a lot more dogs and cats now lockdown's over and all that you know so yeah they've got the hands full in here and a lot of the dogs who come in aren't in a good state that's the other thing so they need a lot of medical attention as well and they also need socializing maybe with humans or other dogs you know they've got lots of problems well paul o'grady you do an amazing job your show for the love of dogs is on tonight at eight o'clock and we'll all be watching thanks so much for joining us tonight thank you Oh, no, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Say bye, Sausage. Ta-da. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, I love Sausage. And you can see so many more pictures from today's visit on our website. Just head to itv.com forward slash Meridian. Now on to other news. And a schoolboy has died after being hit by a minibus in Gravesend. Police were called to Vale Road near North Fleet Technology College just before 8.30 this morning. The air ambulance attended and the child was taken to Darrenth Valley Hospital. Officers are appealing for witnesses and any dash cam footage that could help in their investigation. Southern Rail has confirmed that a man killed at West Worthing train station last night was a train driver. The company says they are heartbroken by the loss of one of their own. Paramedics were called to the station just after 9pm. Transport police say they are working to establish the full circumstances of exactly what happened. It's been revealed the carbon costs alone of the proposed Lower Thames crossing have risen to almost £500 million. Experts believe that changes in how carbon offsetting is calculated mean the price of emissions during construction has risen by 230%. The National Highways project already has a projected budget of more than £8 billion and says the case for the tunnel has never been stronger. 
Well, thousands of train passengers are facing delays and disruption when the Brighton Main Line closes for nine consecutive days later this month. It means there will be no services between Three Bridges, Brighton and Lewis. Well, Network Rail says the closure is needed to allow £15 million upgrade. Tom Savides has our report. It's one of our busiest rail routes, but the Brighton main line will shut for more than a week later this month, grinding services across Sussex to a halt. Network Rail says it has no choice in order to allow essential maintenance work to take place. Why wasn't this work carried out during lockdown when passengers weren't catching trains. Lots of people have, have been asking that question, why didn't we do it during lockdown? Our staff have been working tirelessly throughout the pandemic, keeping the country moving. Works of this scale on, off the shelf. We've had these in the plans for a number of years. And so that's why, whilst we appreciate there is never a good time to shut the railway, doing it now and in this way, we know is the least disruptive we could possibly make it. Preparation work is already underway ahead of a full closure of the line between Three Bridges, Brighton and Lewis for nine days. That will come into effect on the 19th of February. A junction will be replaced, new track laid and embankments will be strengthened to reduce the risk of landslips. Southern says around 6,500 passengers will be affected every day so they're laying on around 200 replacement bus services. But it does mean that those taking the train will face major delays and disruption. It's going to be really inconvenient. They've got to do the maintenance. We can't expect that to happen um, magically. If you want to close the trains, 10 days is extensive. I mean, two, three days maybe. Southern, who runs services on the Brighton Main Line, say they've been telling passengers of the forthcoming work to allow them to plan or make alternative arrangements. It's been publicised for quite some time now through a variety of different channels to make sure that people see it as, as best they can. The work on the Brighton main line is part of a major upgrade across England's rail network. But for nine days, it will frustrate those who rely on the trains. Well, Tom is live outside Brighton station for us tonight. Tom, a tough few weeks ahead for rail passengers once again. Yes, I'm afraid so, because these works are extensive. The closures on the Brighton Main Line beginning the 19th of February may be the longest, but unfortunately they won't be the last. Further closures are expected over the 5th and 6th of March, with more work and closures on April the 3rd. So as you can imagine, it's not looking great for Southern Rail passengers over the next few weeks and months. Thomas Savidi is in Brighton. Thank you. Five Insulate Britain activists have been jailed at the High Court. They were found to have breached an injunction by protesting on the M25 last year and will serve up to 42 days behind bars. Eleven others also received suspended sentences after taking part in demonstrations between different junctions of the motorway last October. More than 30 people have been convicted of drink and drug driving offences following an illegal rave in Sussex last summer. Up to 2,000 people attended the event in a field near Stenning last June. So far, driving bans totalling nearly 40 years have been issued. The Marlowe Theatre has won a prestigious award for its work during the pandemic. Named Theatre of the Year at the height of the last lockdown, the Marlowe made its pantomime available for free online. It was watched by more than 92,000 people and streamed into 91 care homes across Kent. Now an unlucky Brighton driver faces a heavy fine after a seagull swiped a parking ticket from their car. The bird was caught on camera in Kemptown stealing the ticket before flying away. The pictures were then shared on social media. I wonder if he's brought it back. <laughs> You're watching ITV News Meridian here in the South East. Still to come this evening, four months after the death of Sir David Amos, the City on the Sea gets ready to elect a new MP for Southend. 
Next tonight, the Home Secretary has been repeatedly asked today by a committee of MPs how the Navy will be used to deal with migrants crossing the Channel. And repeatedly, she has refused to answer. She said the strategy and tactics are still being worked out. Priti Patel also got into a row with the French President, who today blamed Britain for the small boats crisis. Phil Hornby reports. President Macron didn't use diplomatic language. There's no legal immigration route to Britain, he said. Britain's responsible for the deaths of migrants in the Channel. Britain's immigration policy is hypocritical. The Home Secretary's response wasn't exactly diplomatic either. Macron's comments are wrong. They're absolutely wrong. So let me be very, very clear about that. Those comments are just, they're just wrong. Next, what about the role of the military in the Channel? Will they intercept small boats? Will they push them back? And quite frankly, it's not for me to comment on the tactics that they'll be using or the approach that they'll be using. But that work is taking place, so I'm not going to comment on operational planning. But hold on, said the MPs. This is what a defence minister told the Commons three weeks ago. Neither the Royal Navy nor the Royal Marines will be engaged in pushback. The Royal Navy won't be directly involved in the interception of ships. Are you saying that the Armed Forces Minister was wrong in what he said? Has he, he misled Parliament? No, he hasn't misled Parliament. In. He was wrong in what he said because well, it hadn't been decided. Well, at that stage, I can t uh, in terms of the timing, he has absolutely not misled anybody. The MPs were none the wiser. So they returned to the subject of France, which is where, one Sussex MP says, the solution to this problem lies. The French are not arresting them. They are not, as they should be and we are paying for, taking them to their processing tenses to see what their status is and then dealing uh, with them, which remains the nub of the problem. As so often in these committee sessions, there were far more questions than answers. And still, the small boats keep coming. And Phil, a lot of Tory MPs seem pretty unconvinced by the idea of using the military to deal with the small boats. Yeah, they think this was announced in a panic without being thought through. And one of the biggest critics of the government today became the latest Tory MP to say Boris Johnson should resign. Huge damage has been done uh, with the nation on a trust level. This is being watched internationally. And we're not able to make the big decisions, both on the domestic uh, and on the international stage because this is dominating so much. So I've decided that uh, we can't go on this way. Uh, meanwhile, there is a by-election uh, tomorrow in South End West. Um, I shouldn't think many Tories will be staying up too late for the result because they should win it uh, quite easily. The other main opposition parties, Labour and the Liberal Democrats, not standing against them because of the circumstances of the election. And I think if Labour and the Lib Dems did stand, I think those Tories going to bed tomorrow night will be having nightmares because what is a very safe Tory seat would look very unsafe. But the Tories should win it easily. Phil, live in Westminster, thank you. Well, let's look a bit more closely at that South End West by-election now in the seat which was represented by Sir David Amos. The Labour and the Lib Dems aren't standing, and as John Ryle found out today, some voters in the city are wishing there was more of a contest. But firstly, I want to say sorry. And I'm sorry... With the Prime Minister and Conservative support taking a battering over Partygate and electoral shocks like the Liberal Democrats' by-election victory in North Shropshire, some say there is currently no such thing as a safe Tory seat. Except here, perhaps, in the constituency of South End West, where in tomorrow's by-election the Conservative candidate will run unchallenged by the other major parties facing only eight fringe candidates, a mark of respect to Sir David Amos and a convention set following the murder of the Labour MP Joe Cox in 2016. But some say it's the wrong move, and at the moment this should have been a traditional, full-on contest. There is immense sadness at the death of Sir David Amos. He was very popular. Um, and instinctively I think it's reasonable, to an extent, for people to use their sadness at that in order to say that the election shouldn't be a proper contest. That, um, we should suspend the normal nature of democracy and award the seat to an anointed successor. Um, I think that's not the point, however. Um, democracy isn't dependent on one person. It's not in the gift of one party. And to have an election without a contest 
is not to have an election, it's to have a fake synthetic election. So here in Leon C, the heart of the constituency where Sir David Amos was so popular, what do voters make of the Tory candidate Anna Firth running unopposed by all major parties? I think the other parties are very wise because David Amos was greatly respected down here for all he did. I would have preferred a traditional contest, to be honest with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he's been having parties at the same time as my wife was dying in hospital and I couldn't visit. Um, so she died alone. Uh, and I'm, I'm very unhappy about that. And I won't be voting as a, as a protest. And I've been a lifelong Conservative supporter. The shock at the killing of Sir David Amos is still raw here. And the result of this by-election is really not in any doubt. But some Tories angered by Partygate will protest by not voting at all, by spoiling ballot papers, or by voting for one of the eight marginal candidates who are standing. And those are the numbers the pundits will be poring over after tomorrow's votes have been counted. John Ryle, ITV News, South End. And here is a list of all of the candidates in the South End West by-election and they are in alphabetical order. Voting opens tomorrow at 7am, bright and early, and the polling closes at 10pm tomorrow night. Now let's take a look at what's coming up when the ITV Evening News Hour continues with the national and international news at 6.30. Here's Mary Nightingale. Coming up on the programme, pressure grows on the Prime Minister as more Tory MPs submit letters of no confidence. One of them is a former minister. Another criticised what he called Boris Johnson's mistruths. Also ahead, at least 40 years in jail for the man who killed his former partner and her child. My HRT for menopause symptoms could soon be given over the counter. And the Duchess of Cambridge showcasing her rugby skills at Twickenham. We do join me for that and more at 6.30. Thanks very much, Mary. Pip's with us now. And Pip, you've got some facts and figures for us, a little bit of a test. Yeah, I have <laughs> indeed. So we've started a new month. It can only mean one thing. We're looking back at last month. So let's take a look at how January has shaped up, see okay, what impression you've had of it. So we'll start with the rainfall. Uh, now, the Janu January average comes in at 83.4 millimetres, but did we get more or less than that this year? Less. Less. Okay. It felt very dry, very cloudy. It very was, grey. It was yeah. considerably less. In fact, it was the ninth driest January for England since rainfall records began way back in 1862. And locally, Goudhurst saw just 5% of what we'd expect, just 5.2 millimetres across the whole month. Wow. Uh, how about the temperatures? Now, the average, taking into account both daytime highs and nighttime lows, comes in at 4.4 Celsius. Higher or lower? I think higher. There were days when it was actually warm. In I'm January. going. I'm going lower because there's lower. lots of cold, frosty mm. mornings. Which, well, you know, I'm going to give you both the point there. It was actually higher, but only slightly overall. And that's because you're quite right, Luke. We had plenty of overnight frost, but we've also had some really mild days. And then New Year's Day was, of course, the warmest on record. 16.3 yeah. Celsius reached in southeast England on New Year's Day. Uh, finally, a look at the sunshine amounts. January averages around 55 hours of sunshine in every, any given spot. Did we, did we get more or less than that? Less. This is tricky because... It felt sunnier, they, we said. Yeah. Warmer, more mm. sun. But I don't know, it felt very grey as well. Well, do you know, it was almost 150% of the average. That actually oh made it the goodness. sunniest... Oh, my goodness, it didn't feel like that. It's the sunniest <laughs> January since sunshine records began back in 1919. But I agree, it really didn't feel like that. Yeah. No, what do we really know? Didn't. Thank goodness you're here. <laughs> Dare I say, it felt quite spring-like today, thinking of uh, sunshine. Yeah, Is that really? how things are going to stay for February? Well, Fingers do you know what? Crossed. There are some lovely flowers coming out, but I hate yes. to say it, I'll have to consult my seaweed and my crystal ball to oh, know how okay. February's going to pan out. Oh, <laughs> fine. So, so crystal ball and seaweed at the rest. Here's Pip with the forecast. Feels like home, whatever the weather. Valent Boilers and Heat Pumps, sponsors ITV Meridian Weather.
Well, February may have got off to a very quiet start so far, but things do look a little more changeable over the coming days. A couple of spells of rain, quite breezy at times, perhaps windy for a few spots, but nevertheless, temperatures generally speaking on the mild side for the most part. So a couple of fronts, as I said, coming our way, one notably overnight into Friday morning, another one heads southwards as we head through Sunday. In between, a lot of dry and fairly bright weather and temperatures, as I said, for the most part on the mild side. Certainly out there at the moment, it's looking very quiet, clouding over through the rest of this evening and tonight, but that blanket of cloud acting to keep the temperatures up, probably not much lower than five or six Celsius. And just worth noting, we may see a little bit of light rain or drizzle just clipping the far south coast later in the night. So tomorrow morning then, quite a cloudy start compared to this morning, but frost free all round. As the day wears on, I think that cloud thinning and breaking, more in the way of sunny spells coming through, perhaps just the outside chance of one or two very light showers, but I suspect you'd be pretty unlucky to catch one. And in the best of the sunshine, out of the breeze, it shouldn't feel too bad at all. Highs tomorrow once again up into double figures all round, peaking at 11 or 12 Celsius. These are the high tide times for tomorrow. Then for Sheerness there, 1.44 in the morning, 12 minutes past two in the afternoon. Now through the latter stages of tomorrow, it stays fairly quiet, but overnight into Friday, we'll see that first front drifting its way southeastwards. As it starts to clear, the potential for something a little bit sleety on its back edge, especially so I think over the higher ground. But once it clears, much brighter skies to follow. Those brighter skies taking us into the start of the weekend before things cloud over again with some further rain expected on Sunday. Valent. Sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. As always, it goes downhill for the weekend. It does doesn't? from here. <laughs> just yeah. like always. <laughs> and in just a moment, the ITV evening news tonight. That's with Mary Nightingale. Yes, yeah, Stacey's got our late news after news at 10 at 10.30. But from all of us here at ITV Meridian, thanks so much for your company. We'll see you again tomorrow. Good Have night. A good evening. Bye-bye.